Hey, it's Alex Rackman from Board Game Co. And it's going to be games leaving the collection for April this time. It's been a fun month. I've gotten a lot of different things played and many things that I won't be reviewing as well. It's always a balance of which ones I end up reviewing, which ones I don't. Sometimes it's because, I mean, most of the time these days, just because I don't have enough time to review everything I'd like to. So this is part reviews, part updates, part who knows what in particular. And starting off the bat, we're going to have a tough one, which is going to be Jamaica. Jamaica, is this the right way? That's the right way. Let's show you the back of the box. Jamaica is going to be a game that I've had in my collection for a long time. I believe this is by Gameworks, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, Gameworks. It's a game that I've had in my collection for a very long time. I sought it down way back when I first started playing games in 2012. And then I never had the opportunity to play it because it was a game that was a little lighter than I wanted for my game group, but I didn't really have the family size to be playing it at the time. Now, since then, my family has grown. I've been, this is a long time ago, 2012. And since then, my family has grown, and I've played this with my family, and my kids do enjoy it, but they also don't ask for it. They never ask for it, and even when I suggest it, they are sometimes in the mood, sometimes not. It is a game that I may well get back. I think it's an excellent, lightweight, family-style game or gateway game. It has a lot of fun as you race around the board with your ships to try to effectively win the game, which is going to be through a combination of winning the race and or collecting treasure gold along the way, and some cursed tokens, treasure, all that other stuff as well. Overall, a solid game. It's just, like I said already, too light for my game group, too light for playing with my gateway gamers in my life. It really is a game that ultimately I only play with my children, and sadly... If they're not asking to play it or interested in playing it, then it has to go. But a solid recommendation. I, I've held on to it much longer than I should have, even though we haven't played it in like two years. But it, yeah, tough one. It's a tough one. Lots of tough ones. Next up is going to be Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. This is one that I've actually gone through, I want to say four or five of the seven scenarios. Basically, it's going to be a cooperative deck builder in which you are going to, you know, you're playing as the various good guys, obviously, good guys, whatnot. I mean, not obviously, these days you can play as bad guys too. You're playing as Hermione, Ron, uh, Ginny, I don't know who else, I can't remember, uh, Ron, Harry. You're playing as Harry Potter, that's true. But you're basically going to be going ahead, head to head against various members of the Dark Arts or whatnot as you try to duel against, you know, survival of Hogwarts, all that. Effectively, it's a light deck building game. Uh, it's a good intro deck builder, I think. The first three missions are kind of a write-off. They're good for introducing people to deck builders. So I think we played more than four then. I think we played maybe six of the seven. We never got around to finishing. Effectively, what happened with this one is we played the first six of seven scenarios, and then pandemic hit, uh, COVID, and the people we were playing it with, we were playing with my brother-in-law, sister-in-law. Again, they're not heavy gamers, but it's a good uh, introduction gateway game for them, and it is fun. It's a fun game. Nothing wrong with it. But we, we kind of stopped playing that because of COVID and we stopped having them around. And it's been so long that I don't think we're ever going to finish that seventh scenario. And for me, this is a light enough game that I don't think I would want to keep this past finishing the scenario. I'm happy to to play it, to finish it, to go through those missions and whatnot. Uh, but I don't know if I care enough to jump in and try to find the expansion and dive into that. There is an expansion. There's going to be the, the box of monsters. Plus, I think there's some other stuff. Plus, a ton of promo cards and things like that. Overall, it's a solid game. If you really like Harry Potter as a universe, then great. If you are if you are someone who is more gateway in where you are in your gaming journey or just your gaming taste, perhaps, then I think it's a really solid experience. As far as the depth that I am looking for from a deck builder, I felt it was on the lighter side, despite the fact that it is fun to pull those spells, especially if you are a fan of Harry Potter, which, I mean, we're fans of Harry Potter. I don't, I don't like, have... Harry Potter tattooed on my chest or anything, but I do I do like Harry Potter. I don't know why I talk sometimes. Anyways, moving on from there, we have Katara. Katara is going to be the next game. This is one that I reviewed maybe two, three months ago. I think like three months ago. Either way, this is one that fell in the category when I reviewed it of a game that I said I enjoyed the system, and I do enjoy the system, but I said I think it needs an expansion for me to keep it in my collection long term. And that's something I said about a few different games, but more and more I'm realizing that when I say that, when I say that I need an expansion to keep it in my collection, ultimately what that means is that it's got to leave my collection. Because I'm not averse to getting a game back when the expansion does come out, but I just can't... I don't, I don't want to play this one. I'm looking at it at the shelf. I'm looking at it. And we've gotten a few more plays in since my review. But it's one that... I look at it on the shelf and I keep thinking I want the version with the expansion. I mean, there's no expansion yet. I just, I want a little bit more depth out of this game system and I'm not currently seeing it. So if this expansion comes out, great. But until then, it's sitting on my shelf looking at me and, and staring at me and, and 
I think I'm going to get rid of it instead. And I think in general, when I when I feel a game needs an expansion, I think going forward, I'm probably going to get rid of it off the bat and just make a note to reevaluate, to relook at it when the expansion comes out. This is going to be very much a first world type problem. Thankfully, I have enough games. I have enough games regularly coming in and regularly playing that I just, I don't want to keep a game for the potential of the future. I'll wait till the expansion comes out and evaluate it then. Katara is going to be a light area control game. The, the aspect of it that I really enjoy is the aspect of building out your card where you can be drafting cards, not not hand drafting, but from a center line, you can be drafting cards into your engine. Those cards are going to give you different abilities, such as more movement, more units, more more priests or whatnot, more different like worship. I don't know if they're called priests. I can't remember what they're called. But effectively, you're trying to manipulate the board state to try to get what you want out of the end, out of out of the game, get the most points as you slowly but surely build up your card row and therefore what you can do in the game. Uh, the problem of the game can the fact that the actual gameplay choices are a little bit more minimal than I would like for something that's going to stay in my my collection long term. And then the combat didn't feel like it mattered enough in the game. The combat felt like you, because you make combat made people retreat. It didn't actually hurt anyone or kill anyone, which meant there wasn't a sense of punishment in the game. Now, to a certain extent, it's by design, but it did mean that there was less tense strategy or tough decisions as we played through the game. Overall, a solid one. I, I think it's a good game. I just think for me, for where I am, for where our group is, it's not because it's area control, because it has that meanness to it even though the meanness is abstracted since you're not actually killing anyone because as that meanness it's not something i'm playing with my family and because it doesn't have the degree of tense decisions i want it's not something i sit on the table at game night if an expansion did come out i'd 100 percent be paying attention to it because again i think the core system is excellent i just want more out of the actual engine past that next up is going to be a fistful of meeples now this is going to be a johnny pack design that i really liked for a while for a while uh this is going to be one that is a light game and that effectively has kind of a mancala variant you're going to be grabbing these fistful of meeples hence the name and then slowly sprinkle them around the town as you try to drop them off in the locations that will give you the most bang for your buck the most reward this is going to be a final frontiers game i don't actually know if this was part of like a collection because i just played i just played merchant's cove a review went up for that saturday and i played drawn to adventure a review will be going up for that both of those are currently in my collection or at least currently staying for now uh, merchant's cove i think will be around for a while i don't know how long but i think for a while and drawn to adventure i don't know i need to get more plays in but as of right now it's sticking around but a fistful of meeples is probably in the same category as drawn to adventure for me meaning one that i think i'm going to get my five six plays out of and then eventually decide that i'm moving on from it a fistful of meeples the, Maca the mancala element of the game does make it rewarding i've enjoyed every single play i've had of this game at the same time again that aspect of because it's a lighter game design it's one that and also it's a little longer than i'd like for the lightness of the game it, the box says 30 minutes we found it consistently plays closer to around 40 45 minutes and the the hybrid of lightness to the length is one that makes it a little bit harder to pull out which funnily enough is the same problem drawn to adventure has which again no review up yet but spoilers drawn to adventure has the exact same problem it's an intriguing system and i really enjoy it but i think that i will play through four or five plays of drawn to adventure and then move on from it it's a solid game lots of fun decisions to be made but decisions that at a certain point the game length to lightness just weighs out in such a way that it won't would not stay in my collection long term so fistful of meeples good recommendation but one that i think has like you know try it kind of status as opposed to keeping your collection forever kind of status moving on from there we have five for finding five for finding from haba games this is one i did review on the channel with ricky this is effectively a light little i mean i'm using the word light a lot light is not a dismissive term light is a term that reflects what people are looking for in their collections so far every single thing i've put on the table i can recommend wholeheartedly that's going to be a general trend in these videos where most of what i'm getting rid of i can recommend although i guess five for finding might be the first one that i'd be a little bit more hesitant of but even then it depends on your personal experience of so five for finding is a game that i did rate a two out of five which two out of five is where it starts sliding into that i'd rather not play again category as opposed to three out of five is a solid game four to five is a great game five to five is amazing i love this game do not say anything bad about it because we will have to have We'll have to have words. But five for finding is going to be one that's two out of five. It's one that I'd rather not play again because that's this aspect of you roll dice and then try to find polyomino patterns. Now, I like rolling dice and rolling rights. I like finding polyomino patterns. You'd think that the two combined work really well, but the two combined in this
this game kind of introduce a chaos element. There's going to be uh, more of a real-time aspect to the game. There's two ways to play the game. There's more of a real-time aspect and then less of a... Well, they both have the timer. Just a question of how sensitive is the timer. But effectively, it's solid. It's fun. I enjoyed it. But I also would would would, would request we play something else if you suggested it. It's nice. It's nice. Ricky, Ricky enjoyed it. No, she, Rick, that's not true. Ricky gave it a 3 out of 5. But uh, she's, she likes games. She also would overall request something else. It's one that if the things I told you appeal to you, that roll and write finding shapes, then it might be one that, that you'd enjoy. But for me, the combination didn't work the way I thought it would initially. Moving on, we have Arboretum. Arboretum is a tough one, and this is going to fall very much into that category of a lighter game that is not lighter. It's actually fairly heavy, all things considered. Ugh, Arboretum. So, Arboretum is one that it is longer than I would like, given the semi-filler nature of the game. I think I'm going to put it in the category of, like, thinky filler. One with a lot of tough decisions to be made, and one that I would be thrilled to play. This is probably the one that if you asked me to play, from everything on the table so far, if you asked me to play a game, I'd be most excited to play Arboretum. Yet, we don't pull it out. Again, just to cut, it's just a, that natural problem of, not natural, it's the problem of having too many games and frequently getting new ones. Tough decisions have to be made. Arboretum is one in which you are managing this handful of trees, and you're both placing down trees into your puzzle, as well as the fact that you're trying to balance what trees you keep in your hand, because the trees you keep in your hand let you choose how you're going to score. So you might have the best selection, and for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to say willow trees. You might have the best selection of willow trees in your card row, but if you don't have the most points worth of willow in your hand, you're not scoring for it. So it's a hybrid of trying to build out that board and put what's in your hand, and there's a tough decision aspect of many, all the discards are public, and so you have to choose what to take and watch as other people take things from you, knowing full well that they're going to end up hurting you in this game. The, the reason I'm getting rid of Arboretum is because it's basically the same game every single time. We've gotten our plays, and I've had this for years. I've gotten a, a bunch of plays in and of it, and if they released an expansion or some of the variants, I would absolutely end up picking up it again because I'd want... I'd want that variability or the something else that keeps this game fresh. I don't even know what it is. Maybe it's a set. Maybe it's a, maybe they release it. Renegade Games, if you're watching, go ahead and release a 60 card expansion for Arboretum that represent abilities, just tons of different abilities. And in each game, you shuffle 10 abilities into your Arboretum deck. And that in some way mixes up the game state. Honestly, that would probably make this a keeper for me. Uh, my problem with Arboretum, like I said already, is just that while it's very good, it's a little bit longer for the filler category, and it's the same game every single time. A good game, mind you, but the same game every single time. Moving on from there, we have Get Bit. Get Bit is one that, I mean, I like it. I'm fine with it. I don't have as many positive, flowery things to say. I would say I like it more than Five for Find In, probably less than the rest on this table. Get Bit is a little game which you're trying to not get bit by the shark. You're going to have your little detachable meeples, and they are a door just meeples. They're not really meeples. They're whatever they are. But you see these little guys over here and how his arm just pulls off like that? That's what they're going to be. All their body parts just, I don't know if their head comes off, but they come apart slowly but surely as they get eaten by the shark. The goal of the game is to play your cards in such a way that you move forward, relative, maintaining relative position ahead of other players, in such a way that the shark eats the player who's in last place and not you. You want to try to be effectively the last person with their limbs left standing. It's an excellent premise, a very cute premise, but not one that I'd play at game night. Again, this is a common trend. Not one I'd play at game night and one that therefore I rely on my kids, my children, to decide they want to play. And while they enjoy it, they also don't really ask to play it or choose it when given it as an option. Solid game, easy recommendation, Mayday games, but also, again, just very fun, but very specific and nuanced in what it's doing. It falls in that category of being a cute little party trick, not necessarily one that you need to keep long term, but one that's certainly worth trying. And then finally, not finally, finally for the pile on this side, I have a whole pile over here. Finally, we're going to have Quinto. Quinto's going to be a roll and write that I am getting rid of, not because it's bad, same problem, but because I have too many roll and writes coming in, and Quinto is good, but not, I'd argue, better. Uh, Quinto is one that I actually did a review of Quinto, as well as four others in a little series of five small, small games. I think they're all roll and writes, mostly, no, they're not all roll and writes, they're mostly roll and writes, all from Pandasaurus. But effectively, Quinto is one that you're going to be, this is not the Pandasaurus version of the game, they have new production, but Quinto is going to be one where you're basically going to roll dice and then mark off on one of three different rows where you're going to put the number. Now, like most Roman rights, there's a system in place. The system is, you know, you can only go higher, and then you're trying to score for columns, and you're trying to not fill certain things. It's, and if you fill the full row, you're going to get even more points. Lots of little nuanced things to manage in the game. 
Overall, the game length is excellent, but I find more and more my wife and I are not like I can knock this out in like five to seven minutes basically. But my wife and I, I find we don't pull out games that are five to seven minutes long unless they are good enough in that five to seven minute time frame. More and more we pull out games that are in the I would say 15 to 25 minutes is going to be our ideal filler. So if you really want a five to 10 minute game and you this and you don't have any collection, highly recommend Quinto. If you have the 15 to 25 minutes, I recommend Railroad Inc. or Welcome To or a bunch of other meteor, more fun, uh, Fleet the Dice game. That's so much fun. A little longer than 30, I'd say it's close to around 45 minutes. There's a lot of solid roll and write engines, Merchants of Magic, which you just reviewed, that I enjoy them far more than this abstracted Quinto. Quinto was a great addition to my collection for a while, but I would say contrast with like, let's say something like, uh, something like Get Bit it falls in the category of a game that I'd recommend trying and then moving on from if it's not for you, but it's a unique experience. Quinto, I think, is not unique enough in the space we're in. I'd recommend different roll and writes over Quinto, unless you specifically want that five to 10 minute experience. Moving on, we have, oh my gosh, it's gonna be a fun one. We have Ra, Ra that is finally leaving my collection. Now I actually talked about this. I did a video, top 10 worst games in my collection, which was going over t the 10 worst games I still own, 10 games that I had chosen to keep and keep on choosing to keep. And I said at the time that many of these will likely show up in future games leaving the collection video. The fact that I'm labeling it as the worst game in my collection means there's a reason I'm looking at this reason I'm giving it that, you know, stinky eye, so to speak, and, and thinking about what's going on. Now, Raw, it's not a bad game at all. I remember I saw a particularly funny comment that someone said, if that's the, if, that, if that's one of the 10 worst games in your collection, I hope you only own 10 games. Very cute comment. But not, that being said, Ra is an amazing game. It was an amazing game. It was one of the most condensed raw forms of auctioning in a game in a system that is so well designed that is thoroughly thoroughly enjoyable but it's also very dry we don't pull it out there are other games that i think interweave auctioning into the game in a way that is more rewarding if i want if you, you said i just want a raw auction game that that does nothing else and does it amazingly well i'd recommend raw it's excellent if you offered to play it, I would play it. I'd happily play it. The set collection, the, the calling of Rod, the choosing of when to go high, when to go low, because of the fact that the auction doesn't go round and around, you have one solitary attempt to make your bid. There is so much tenseness to this Rainer Knizia game. It is so rewarding. But again, rewarding and yet dry, not one that I want to pull out. And in fact, Tigris and Euphrates is another one that starting to get the stinky eye as well. There, there are some games that it's not that they're bad, it's that I've had them for so many years. I've had Ra for maybe seven, eight years by now. I've played this dozens of times. It's an excellent experience, with one that I feel I have played out. Uh, for right now, I prefer games that have a, a mixed-in auction mechanic, a game like Cyclades that has an auction mechanic that is so much fun, but is part of the core mechanism and not the core mechanism. Not that I'm against it as the core mechanism. I just, again, I look at Raw, and we rarely, rarely suggest it. We rarely pull it out. It is incredibly good. An easy recommendation if you haven't tried it. You will fall in love with it. It is excellent, but also time to go. From there, we have Guardians, which is going to be one of two in this list that I have not played. Guardians is going to be a game that I foolishly got my hands on this one because it looked cool and I wanted to try it, and I just have no interest in pulling it off the shelf. It, it falls in that, it's going to first of all fall into that two-player head-to-head category that I generally don't end up keeping. I don't know much about the game. It's by, uh, what's it called? It's by uh, Plaid Hat Games. Two-player head-to-head system. I think it has deck building. It has cards. It has powers. It has abilities. I, I keep looking at it, and it does look fun. We have the Harbinger. Immobile. Harbinger can't be moved. We have Dark Call. You may play this card after a hero is knocked out. Move an enemy hero to Grave's location and deal three damage to that hero. Lots of cards. Lots of abilities. But for me, that is a system that I find does not see play as often as I'd like because you need people to know the systems at play, to know the cards, the decks, the engines, to op fully optimize your experience. So Guardians is one that I keep looking at, keep deciding whether I am or I'm not playing it, but with the the bulk of unplayed games that I have, it's just one that's so low down the list that I do not see it hitting the table anytime soon. Moving on, we have Architects of the West Kingdom. This is going to be my second time getting rid of this game. This is going to be Architects of the West Kingdom with the expansion uh, something, I don't remember what the expansion's called, but with the expansion inside the box. And Architects is one, I'd show you the back, but there's not much to see here. Architects is one that, it, it falls into the whole Shem Phillips series of games that I have not loved. I've, I've always enjoyed every single one of them, but I haven't felt the need to keep any of them. I play the whole Raiders of the North Sea with all expansions. I do have Raiders of Scythia coming my way because I, I want to try it. They're so well rated as games that I feel I have to 
I have to play them all. I have Viscounts on my shelf up there that I do plan against the table. I've played Paladins. Paladins, I definitely moved on fun with no second thoughts. Arctics, on the other hand, is a game that I got back because I love the mechanic of placing people so that things get stronger and then capturing people so that that person can no longer take excessively strong actions. And that's what Arctex is. It's a worker placement game in which every time you place a worker in your location, you take something, but you take more things if you have other workers there. So each time you place a worker, it gets progressively more powerful, which is so much fun watching that engine build up and then placing your guy down, taking nine coins in a single action. And for some weird reason, no one stops you. So it gets back to your turn. You take 10 coins in a single action. It is so much fun. And then in turn, capturing other players keeps that engine in check. It allows for the fact that when I capture your players, I'll both get a reward, as well as the fact that I've stopped your engine from advancing. And yet I find the rest of the game around Architects is what I don't enjoy. The core engine I love. Now, I, again, I reviewed this a long time ago. Back when I first played, I got a few games in, and then I decided I was ready to move on from it. And and at the time, I not that time, since then I've had second thoughts because of how well-rated the game is, because of how many people talk about how much they love it, and yes, I am definitely influenced by peer pressure, or even just the BGG Top 100, especially when it's a game that had a a system, a, a core conceit that I really appreciated and want to see done in other games. I want to see that done again, because it's so much fun. But the rest of the game around Architects, I just don't love. I don't find it rewarding. I find it an uphill climb to get things done. It's a game where you feel like you, you play for a decent amount of time. You play for 90 minutes and it feels like a constant struggle to get anything done, to build a building, to advance in the cathedral, to take advantage of the black market, to manage your prisoners, all these things. And I, I don't find, I said this at the time, and I, I got pushback on this, but it's still true for me. I don't find that the the advancement of your, I can't remember what it's called, but your your track where you, your morality or whatever it is, but your morality track as it goes up or, or higher or lower, I don't find that it plays well off that. I don't find the interplay works. The higher you get, the more you can pay off debts. But if you're high enough, you don't have debts, unless of course you went low first, in which case the only real option in the game is to go low, then go high. Is that the driven force? Because if you just go low, you're eventually going to keep taking debts. If you go high, then low, that doesn't work. If you go exclusively low, it could work. If you go exclusively high, you're not getting the full potential. It kind of feels like they don't really interweave or interplay off each other in the way that I ideally want, especially because the lower you go, you can't go to the cathedral. The higher you go, you can't go to the black market. It it feels it feels like it doesn't really work for me. I like the core aspect of magnif uh, magnifying actions and the prevention of such. I don't love the rest of the game around it. I've played it again. The base game, I've played it again. The base game with the expansion. I do recommend the expansion, by the way. If you are going to keep it, absolutely, I would never play this without the expansion. It adds another element into the game, and I appreciate and enjoy that element. But even though it's better for me, it's still not a game that I want to not want to play. It's still not a game that I am in a rush to play again, given the other games in my collection. Moving on, we have the next one is going to be Gods of War. Gods of War, where am I with these titles? Gods of War is going to be another one that I have not played. Still in Shrink. This is a command game that I don't have much interest in. I don't know why. I don't know why I, I got it. I got it because I thought I'd be interested. I love God of War, the video game. I do love that. And I am very excited for God of War, the miniatures game, when Kaman eventually makes it. Kaman, that's a that's a request I'm making right now. If you can go ahead and make the Gods of War miniature game with ridiculously over-the-top enemies that you have to fight, and I'd really appreciate that. That'd be great. And you know it'd make a lot of money. I'm guessing 5 million Kickstarter. 5 million? That sounds about right, right? We can do that. So go ahead and make the miniatures game. I'll definitely get that, and I'll play that. The card game for me does not pull me in. I was intrigued initially, and then it sat on my shelf, and I haven't played it. And again, like Guardians, at a certain point, I have to choose to recognize that a game that I once had an interest in is not going to get played. Next up, we have Caper. Caper's going to be, what else do we have here? We have Caper, and then one more. So, Caper's going to be a two-player game that, uh, they just had the Kickstarter for Caper Europe. This is going to be by, I can never remember the company, I can never remember the name of the company, by Keymaster Games, who did Parks. Parks is amazing. I love Parks. I did not love Caper, unfortunately. I would play it again if you wanted to play it. I'd certainly play it again. But I, unfortunately, I just I didn't find it rewarding or intricate enough. I found it to be so it's maybe you're going to have three different locations and you're playing spies to these locations across a few rounds. That box is falling open. You're going to play spies to those locations across a few rounds and ultimately try to get the most points. You're going to get points for capturing locations or getting the location. You're also going to get points for various items you play, a whole bunch of different ways you can get points. And then this is the aspect of your playing items on spies and then there's a variety of different locations to adjust the flavor of the game i think it's solid i can understand why people would like it uh, for myself i i didn't love the iconography way too many icons for a game this light like absolutely every player needs their own player aid and there isn't a player aid 
Like every player is passing the rule book back and forth to look at the icons the whole first game. It's I did not appreciate or enjoy that experience. But past that, past once you get past the iconography, once you lock it in and understand what's happening, then I think it is good, but not rewarding enough for me. I don't know exactly what it is. I think it just comes down to it's a little bit too just counting the numbers. I'd much rather play airline and sea. I'd much rather play battle line. I'd much rather play other systems where I feel there's a little bit more intricacy into what's happening as you vie for control over different battlefields. In Caper, I kind of felt it was I play my card, you play your card. I appreciate the drafting aspect. It does have two-player drafting, the cards back and forth. Uh, solid. Not one that I feel the need to keep or play again. And then lastly on this list, we have one that I really had a hard time with, and that is going to be Coloma, again by Johnny Pack. Johnny Pack is going to have both Fistful Meeples and Coloma. This is another Final Frontier Games, and it's my favorite Final Frontier game so far. That's not true. Merchant's Cove is my favorite, favorite Final Frontier game so far. So, uh, Coloma is going to be one. Let's show you the back of the box over here. You have the whole board situation over there going on, and it's basically going to have a few interesting mechanics in the game. I'm going to just put this down because I can't keep everything up here. But effectively, Coloma is one in which you are managing the gold rush of, well, Coloma, I guess. But you're going to be going ahead and taking actions, and it has this aspect of the game of busting. Every round, you're going to select where your person goes, and you will take the actions associated with that location. But if more than, if the, if you go to the location where the most players go, then that location will bust, and you'll get a lower action. Still get an action, low action. Now, I do love how in the game, they do give you mitigation for that. As you build out your engine, as you build out your cards, there's a lot of mitigation for busting in such a way that I would argue that anyone who complains about busting in the second half of the game, well, you're doing it wrong. The flip side is if you complain about busting in the first half of the game, then I completely un completely understand that. You may well off you may well have a disadvantaged start as you bust every single round for the first five rounds of the game. Well, specifically there's three rounds, and each round is five actions, total of 15 actions. You bust for the first 15 actions, for the first five of your 15 actions, and you will have a harder game than other players. And I say that because that happened when we played it. Not to me, mind you. I, I won the game, so keep in mind this is not coming from a stance of a sore loser or whatnot. I won the game. I enjoyed the game but even this is not why i'm getting rid of it coloma even like mostly not, i would argue that it is less likely that you will bust in the first five actions all the time it depends on how many games you play but i would argue it's not gonna happen to every person on average it will average out and to a certain extent you want to play based on what you think others will do and adjust your actions accordingly but again it's a possibility that you can bust for me the game is going to be i'm getting rid of it because of a totally different reason that is usually not the reason i get rid of games I felt I was able to do everything in this game to the point that we played it. I read the rules and just to make sure that I was doing it correctly. And it seems like we're doing everything correctly, but I felt like I was able to do absolutely everything I wanted in the game, except of course, defeating the bandits, not of course, except defeating the bandits. So a few aspects, you're going to be managing multiple tracks in this game. You're going to be managing putting out your tents to get points. You're going to be managing to building bridges and uh, rivers to get points. You're going to be managing to build cards to get points. Now, I think the cards are essential. I basically went heavy on the card strategy and at that point meant every single action I was taking was being augmented by the buildings, by the cards that I was putting down. And, and I, just felt that I could do almost everything I wanted. I built uh, most of the tents that I needed to get this magnifying scoring of points. I built most of the rivers, most of the bridges, and got everything I needed there. And then I built like nine different buildings for cards, which was just a ton of buildings. Everyone else had, you know, uh, everyone else had a lot of buildings as well. But going heavy on cards just allowed me to do absolutely everything I wanted, or most of everything I wanted. I should, again, it's clear distinguishing. I couldn't do everything, but I was able to do far too much. I felt that the game did not really restrict me. It was a lot of fun. The core engine here, really love it. If you ask to play Coloma, uh, really, I'd be happy to play it. Something about it is holding it back for me from being a, for me, I'd rate this like a three out of five, based on one play, factor that in. But for me, I'd, base it, I'd rate it a three out of five. I can easily see it being higher. I can easily see it being a four to five if some other things were going on in the game. I don't know. I don't have a clear distinction as to what. And they do have some modules. We played with one of the modules, not both. I did not play with the hotels module. I did play with the special powers module. In fact, I wondered if the special powers module is why I was able to do too much and if that might affect or bias my stance on it. Overall, I'm, I'm going on a lot. It's almost like I should have done a full review. I just didn't want to do a full review on it after only playing it once, especially for a game that I'm getting rid of. And I don't want to play it again. Not I don't want to. I'm not in a rush to play it again, given all the games I could otherwise play, but it's a solid one. It's one that if I were at your house, or hey Johnny, um, if I, you know, if I were ever hanging out, I'd happily play it with you. I'd watch you uh, completely destroy me, and then maybe that would motivate me to uh, try it again. A solid game. It really is a solid engine of what it's doing. I just didn't feel restricted enough, such that 
too much stuff was coming in. It reminded me of Imperial Settlers, uh, which is a game that had that same aspect. Sometimes I find that when a game lets me do too much, it is just as problematic as when a game lets me do too little. I don't love it when resources are flowing in left, right, and center, and when I could just do most of what I want on any given turn. So it's a balance. It's a balance that, for me, Coloma went a little bit too far. If it were pulled back a bit, I can see it being more for my taste. As it is, it's one that I can easily recommend, but also one that I'm not keeping, because that's the nature of having a lot of games and picking and choosing what gets played. That's going to be the list. A lot of games going out this week, uh, this month, not this week. If I did this every single week, it would be a shorter video, because there'd be less games. But there'll be more coming next month, as always. There are always games coming in, always games going out, and... At some point, I should start doing more videos on the games that have stood the test of time, games that have been in my collection for eight years or whatnot. The problem is I don't have clear data of, oh, I can't just like filter. I'd have to like look through my games and kind of think, look, yeah, that game I've had for five years, right? I think. I'm not certain. That's basically it. Yeah. Until next time, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, let me know which ones, I mean, I always ask this question, it feels boring now, but nonetheless, I'll do it anyway. Let me know which of these games you think I'm wrong about. Maybe Coloma, maybe Coloma is one that you feel is harder to do everything you want, and, and maybe I'm actually reading the rules wrong and doing something uh, incorrectly, I don't know. Architects of the West Kingdom, I don't particularly care if you feel I'm wrong about, I, I gave it another shot, I tried. It's just not for me. It's not every game has to be for everyone. And speaking of which, I have coming up at some point, I need to flesh out the list, but I have coming up at some point a video of top 10 underrated games, which is specifically going to be games that I feel are underrated, games that I feel are like 5 out of 5 for me, and yet the general mass audience or BGG rates are like a 7.2 or something like that. There are definitely going to be games like that. Everyone has their own unique, special, magical snowflake tastes in games, and this is just a video about mine. Until next time, have a good one.